Good morning. Happy Tuesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. A busy Tuesday as usual. And I got a really good QA. Um, we get to look at some of the aspects of the model in, in a little bit of context of, of walking um, versus running. So this question comes from David. David says, Hello, Bill. Well, hello, David. Uh, wondering if you could shed some light on any differences in the propulsive phase of gait when we're discussing running versus walking. I just recently began following your Q&A segments, and I'm still trying to wrap my brain around some of the model's terminology and, and concepts. Thank you for your consideration. Cool. This is a great question, David. Real quick, let me point you to some stuff that's that's on my YouTube channel that, that will be helpful. So there's already discussions about, about the propulsive phase um, on, on YouTube. So, so check those videos out. There's also videos on yielding and overcoming actions, which will be very important because we're going to talk about that a little bit in this context. Um, and then I would also look at some of the hip rotation um, videos as well. And so, so those will guide, oh, curve running is also might be of, of interest to you since we're going to talk about running versus walking. Um, there's some, some cool stuff in there as well. But anyway, let's, let's dig into this. So we're gonna have some stuff that's in common and we're gonna, we're gonna have some, some things um, that, that are different because um, we, we got differences in viscoelastic tissue behavior. And to be honest with you, we could probably talk a whole week about this. Um, and I'm not talking about a whole week of these kind of videos, I'm talking about like literally a whole week about this uh, because there, there's a lot of detail that we could get into. But it, let's, let's just consider some of the commonalities because we're talking about two forms of locomotion um, so they're going to have aspects that, that are very, very similar. So both walking and running, regardless of speed, um, we're going to have a max propulsive phase. So this is a point where we're going to be applying maximum force into the ground. The cool thing about that is that under almost all circumstances, that, that position of the foot is going to be the same. And so, so the max propulsive foot is actually when the heel breaks from the ground. So it's not like way up here. Um, it's actually right where the where the heel breaks the ground, and so when we're talking about walking, we're gonna we're gonna move through ankle rocker. The heel's gonna come up. If we're talking about sprinting, we're coming down from the ground, and and as we apply force to the ground, the heel is just just gonna barely miss the ground. It's gonna stay slightly above the ground. So we're talking about the same propulsive position of the foot, regardless of whether we're talking about any form of locomotion um, in, in regards to two feet on the ground kind of a thing. Um, so, so that's kind of cool, which is, which is really helpful. Um, the ground contact, regardless of, of running speed or walking, is always going to be slightly in front of the center of gravity. This ha actually has to happen. So there's actually a little bit of a breaking force, even at top speed running, because what we have to be able to do is we actually have to be able to create the compressive strategy um, with ground contact that, that stores the energy to release it, whether we're, we're, we're walking or running. Now, obviously, at very high speeds, that that distance in front of the center of gravity needs to be minimized because we want to minimize the braking force to run really, really fast. But it still has to happen. Otherwise, we don't get the compression and expansion that's associated with the, the storage and release of energy. The pelvis is still going to move through its inhalation and, and exhalation um, bias. But obviously, the faster we run, the, the faster that's going to occur and actually the excursion is going to be limited and much more biased. So the faster we go, the more we're going to be biased towards an, an exhalation strategy. And so, so now let's go, go deep into some, some differences. So walking has a longer period of time between, between ground contact and, and max propulsion compared to running. So what this means is that the forces are going to be dissipated over a much longer period of time because of the slower rate of locomotion. We need a longer delay in the propulsive strategy so we can swing the other leg out in front of us so we don't, we don't fall on our face. So running has a much shorter period of time, regardless of, of what running speed we're talking about, there's a shorter period of time between ground contact and max propulsion. At top speed, the elite sprinters, um, they'll, hit, they'll hit ground contacts as brief as, as 0.08 seconds. Um, so it's nearly instantaneous as to, as to how they're landing, which again, it's gonna lend us to trying to understand, okay, what is this hip or pelvis actually doing um, at, the, at the point of ground contact and why we have such a strong bias. Um, so we still need a delay 
to swing the other leg through, but it's gonna be very, very brief. Now, the, one of the coolest things about, about walking versus running, for me, um, is just the behavior of viscoelastic tissue. So we're talking about, about differences in force, and so, so there's, there's seven components of force that influence the viscoelastic uh, tissue behavior. So we got uh, magnitude, location, direction, duration, frequency, variability, and rate. So I can only say them in that order, but there's seven of them. But, but we're gonna talk primarily about the rate-related issue because that's the easiest one that we can, we can visualize um, with walking versus running because we're, we're dealing with a, with a time constraint. So the higher rate of loading, the higher the rate of loading, so the faster we load tissues, the stiffer that they're, they're going to behave, the harder they become to deform but when we do deform them, they can store a heck of a lot more energy and therefore they can release a lot more energy, which is what we see at higher running speeds. But we also see a lot of cool stuff like stress fractures and, and um, like, uh, like tissue related um, issues that are associated with these high forces over longer periods of time. So, so if you wanna start a great business, what I would suggest you do is you wanna work with, with runners because um, those people are going to experience a lot of tissue loading over short periods of time. And again, if they're exposed to longer durations, they're gonna accumulate the, um, a lot more of, of these issues. At the reduced rate of loading, when we see with walking, the tissues are less, sti less stiff. We're gonna see a lot more yielding uh, action associated with that because again, we have to dissipate those forces over a much longer period of time and that's gonna help slow us down um, as we walk. So again, the yielding strategy provides us that delay that's necessary to, to hold the center of gravity back so we can get the other leg out in front of us. So again, we're talking about rate-related issues here. The faster we move, so whether we walk faster or, or run, we're gonna see a reduction in the amount of rotation that's available to us. So we've got a time constraint um, that, that's associated with this um, for sure, because again, it, we have to consider the, the time from ground contact to, to max propulsion. So when we're walking, we're gonna land in a fair amount of external rotation. We're gonna move through internal rotation through that max propulsive phase, and then we're gonna go back to external rotation. Well, if we're running at top speed, especially, um, we're landing at, at almost immediate max propulsion. So the amount of rotation that we have, one, available to us, because we don't have time for that, um, it's gonna be a very, very quick internal rotation that's gonna be associated with that. So this is why we're gonna see biases in runners, like the anti-orientation of the pelvis gets us closer to, to that, that internal rotation moment that we need at max propulsion. So, so that's why every sprinter kind of looks the same in, in that regard, is because it's, it's just a trained bias that allows them to perform something um, very, very quickly. So in a nutshell, um, Walking and running are gonna demonstrate some very, very similar characteristics because it's still locomotion. We still have to be able to propel, um, our, propel ourselves um, uh, against gravity, move ourselves forward. So again, we, we're gonna have a max propulsion, but the rate at which we would see any form of, of bias occur is going to be different. The ranges of motion that we're exposed to are gonna be a little bit different. The breathing strategy is gonna be biased a little bit differently, and certainly the tissue behavior is gonna be a little bit different. So again, I would point you towards the yielding and overcoming strategy video to, to get a little bit of understanding about that because at the higher rates of loading, we're gonna see a lot more overcoming action. At the slower rates, we're gonna see a more yielding action. So David, I hope that kind of points you in a little bit in the right direction. If I didn't cover something that you wanted to talk about, please ask me another question at askbillhartman at gmail.com and I will see you guys tomorrow.